you saw the thumbnail, but there's more to it. I'm up to something. This is the new mid-2023 Razor Blade 14, a model RZ090482. My interest in this laptop extends purely to the PCIe tunneling capabilities, however, I was delightfully surprised at how capable this machine really is. So let's dive in and take a look. First off, I'm rocking some new threads, at least until my new wardrobe by Linus gets here. What? What? <laughs> Alright, so if you've been following the channel for a while, you, you're probably figuring that I'm up to something. I mean, this is the same processor, basically, in a mini PC, but in laptop form. Actually, Razer's also packed in a 40 series GPU from NVIDIA, so it's, you know, the unholy union of AMD and NVIDIA. But the important thing is we're rocking that 7940HS display. But we've also got a QHD 240 hertz display, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and a one terabyte SSD, along with an RTX 4070. That's the mobile version of the RTX 4070, where 4070 means something different than it does in desktop. But I digress. Let's unpack. Designed and engineered by Razer in California. Razer.com. Power brick. Weighing in at a hefty 1.2 kilos. No, nah, not really, it's 0.9 kilos, but but still, very nice eco-friendly packaging. Pretty sure there's nothing here that a turtle could get hung up on, so that's nice. And then, the box within a box. Oh yeah, the Forest Stewardship Council. Look at that. In the box there's also some Razor stickers, and a cloth for getting the fingerprints off of the matte finished metal. Now even though I've already been handling this a bunch, it really is pretty reluctant to pick up fingerprints, which is nice that it has that kind of a finish. It's going to endure a little bit better. In terms of ports and connectivity, they're all on the left and right hand side. On the left side, we've got power, USB type A, USB-C, and a combination headphone microphone jack. On the other side, we've got a Kensington lock port, an HDMI 2.1 port, uh, another type A, and another type C. And that's it, that's all you get. Now the Blade 14 measures 0.7 inches by 8.97 by 12.23 inches. Uh, for metric, it's 7.99 millimeters by 228 millimeters by 310.7 millimeters. And it's just four pounds or 1.84 kilograms. It has a 14 inch 16 by 10 QHD 240 hertz refresh display. It's a modern 16 by 10 aspect ratio. It comes with a two year battery warranty, which I thought was incredibly impressive. And they've somehow managed to get the RTX 4070 with 140 watt TGP. So that's pretty much the most powerful 4070 that I'm aware of. I mean, that's about, about a third more than the previous generation Razer laptop. 2560 by 1440, 240 hertz is a very nice display experience. And this is coming from somebody who was running a very high resolution 4K, but with the in-between scaling and it was never perfectly sharp and I could never really run it at native resolution because Windows never really has gotten the display scaling stuff to operate correctly, especially when you're using an external monitor and the monitor that's external doesn't necessarily match. I mean, you'd have to run a 27 inch 4K monitor to match the laptop, but I don't want to run a 4K laptop display at 200% scaling. I want to do like 150, 175%. And 27 inch for the external monitor really isn't exactly the same. And why is this still a problem in 2023? Well, the hardware solution is exactly what Razer has done. 2560 by 1600 on the laptop display. You've run it 100% scaling and then you can use whatever external monitor you want and it's great. And yes, you can use both USB-C for external display or run a dock that is Thunderbolt compatible. And then you can run multiple displays off of that dock. Although it's not magically going to have more resolution. You're still constrained to the 40 gigabit of Thunderbolt, which is good for one high resolution, high refresh display, or a couple of lower resolution, high refresh displays, or a couple of high resolution standard refresh displays. But you've also got two USB-C ports, so you can run one and one. Now the power connector and the power brick and the power cord, as I alluded to, are chunky. And that is because this power brick is 230 watts. For these top of stack CPUs from AMD, they, it doesn't pull any punches. You can use a lot of power and get a lot of performance out of it. I mean, it's an eight core processor after all, but we've also got that 4070 in there. And so the balance of the power budget's actually gonna go to the 4070, not the Ryzen 7000 CPU that we're dealing with. For benchmarks, I didn't really realize that this level of performance 
was possible out of a laptop. Okay, I'm being a little facetious, but the fact that this thing will use 200 watts when running off of an external adapter, it puts that to good use. And the cooling solution was able to keep up with that. So you basically get very nearly desktop class performance. And you can see that in our Geekbench score here. 2,500 single thread and over 11,000 multi-thread. This is faster even than some mini PCs based around the same processor. And a mini PC you would expect to be faster because it's running off of an external power brick. It's not designed to be in a laptop. It has a better cooling solution than a laptop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you see? The 4070 performance is pretty good. We'll come back to that. And in PC Mark, which is a little bit more exhaustive, things get a little bit more interesting. I decided to run the test on battery and not on battery because, look, if this thing is drawing 200 watts at the wall, given the battery capacity, math tells us that the battery is going to last about 30 minutes. So how much performance do you give up when it's actually running on battery? And the answer is some, but not a huge amount. It's a score of about 5,500 versus almost 8,000 overall in PC Mark. I mean, that is a fair bit of performance, but in terms of actually using the machine, it's pretty responsive. It's pretty snappy, it's surprisingly fast. Oh, and for the rundown test, which is, you know, a whole other battery test, that's interesting, you can get really good battery life. But running these benchmarks unplugged on battery, these and the application tests, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, something like that. And in that time, I was able to deplete the battery by about mm, 40%. So we can extrapolate and say that if you're running this thing full tilt insane benchmark workload, you're still gonna get over two and a half hours of performance. So that's pretty good, really. Also did the PC Mark applications test, the score of about 8,000 versus 11, 12,000, something like that. Percentage wise, it's roughly a similar percentage. The only thing that was really hurt in performance was Microsoft Excel. Microsoft Excel really benefits from the ridiculously insane performance of this eight core processor when it's un running unconstrained on the garden hose-like power cable that's running into the laptop. It's very well engineered. Now, obviously, if you're buying a Razer laptop, you're interested in gaming performance, right? Yes, obviously. So running games with the native resolution of the panel 2560 by 1600 Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you can expect 98 FPS with DLSS off and ray tracing off. If you turn DLSS on and ray tracing off, it's about 160 FPS and 131 FPS with ray tracing and DLSS. Cyberpunk similarly, 60 FPS 2560 by 1600. Whoa. If you enable DLSS, you can get 73. Uh, FPS and if you turn ray tracing on it can still manage 50 2560 by 1600 but you're gonna need to turn DLSS on and I would probably back off the resolution just a little bit more ray tracing is a little bit of a struggle with the 4070 in cyberpunk dropping down to 1080p you can clear 100 FPS in just about every game Callisto protocol was over 104 FPS in Borderlands 3 you can get 128 FPS and, and let me tell you 128 FPS on this 240 Hertz display is something else on a laptop it feels feels wrong somehow Far Cry 6 was 107 FPS and the Rift Breaker GPU benchmark was over 100 FPS Shadow of the Tomb Raider was 150 FPS at 1080p high <laughs> impressive all right let's talk about off-label uses USB 4. Listen, I'm going to level with you. It's not going to make sense to use a USB 4 enclosure for video ever. The reason is that best case scenario, you've got three PCIe or PCIe Gen 3 four lanes worth of it. This thing already has a 4070 in it, and the 4070 is connected at PCIe 4.0 by 8. If you put a 4090 in this uh, in an external enclosure that can handle it, this one can't. But, you know, like the one from Cooler Master. Cooler Master has an excellent enclosure. I've got a Radeon 7 in this one. And yeah, if you want to be able to run an external GPU like this off of your laptop, you totally can. It really only makes sense if you're doing machine learning or cryptocurrency mining, but that's not really a thing anymore. But what that PCIe tunneling USB 4 interface gives you is the ability to run a really nice high-end docking station-like thing. Unfortunately, you're still going to have to use your power connector. It's just not possible to deliver 230 watts over a USB Type-C connector. So you'll have power plus USB Type-C, but you can use that USB Type-C connector to run an external GPU with a couple of monitors and it can still be rendered in a laptop and then still sent outward. Or you can do what I do, which is use it basically as a fancy dock with a high-speed network connector. I mean, this thing doesn't have a built-in wired Ethernet adapter and it is insanely fast. The Wi-Fi solution is a Qualcomm W685XN. 
That is a Wi-Fi 6E dual band solution and it works very well in this laptop. There do exist USB-C to five gigabit adapters, but if you wanna run 10 or 25 gigabit, a bulky adapter is what you're gonna need. There are less bulky 10 gig ethernet adapters, but I'd rather just have the PCIe slot so I can upgrade it and do something else. And you do get a full four lane connector on either side. USB type C connectors are not necessarily all four lanes wide when you're doing PCIe tunneling, but I'm happy to report in this case, they are. I can get the equivalent of a PCI Express 3.0 by four lane width connection from the USB-C connections on this to our external enclosure. And that's important because that means there's, there's BIOS level stuff, there's board level stuff, there's driver level stuff in Windows. In fact, I only got one blue screen, the one PFN list corrupt update thing on Windows, which was fine after I rebooted. It's just PCIe tunneling hot plug. Thunderbolt compatible, if you will, but we can't call it Thunderbolt because it's not an Intel platform, but it is PCIe tunneling and it does work perfectly. Now, what about Linux? So Linux, the installation was an interesting experience. I did need to update the kernel and it was a little bit of a, uh, of a juggling act to get the touchpad working. I think if you're gonna run Linux on this, ironically, somewhat not ironically, Pop! OS works pretty well on this laptop for uh, Linux connectivity and Linux functionality. The battery life on Linux was also dramatically better. I mean, just for every day, like I'm gonna browse the internet and answer emails and not really do a lot. We're talking on the order of like six and a half, seven hours. If you power up the GPU and you do more intensive things than that, running the 4070 not in sleep mode, more like two, three hours, the GPU really consumes a lot of power, but I've got no complaints about boosts or anything like that. As we saw in PC Mark on Windows, when it's plugged into the wall, you can get those fancy five plus gigahertz boosts. In Linux, it's pretty much the same story, which tells me that their hardware, the hardware end of things and the Linux plumbing in the kernel is basically there. It doesn't seem to boost quite as high as it does on Windows, so I think Windows has gotten a little bit more tuning than Linux and the drivers and the kernel and everything that's there, but it still worked reasonably well. I could get four gigahertz-ish on battery pretty consistently, and I did see over five gigahertz boosts when it's plugged into the wall in Linux using Linux productivity tests. For internals and upgradability, it is slotted memory. So if you want to upgrade up as far as 64 gigabytes in the future, when those SODIMs become available and affordable, you can shove a bunch of DDR5 SODIMs in there and get 64 gigabytes in a portable machine. That'll probably also impact battery life, at least until things get a little bit more uh, available in terms of very low power DDR5, but it is an option. For storage, the SSD is a Samsung one, albeit an OEM model, but it is the high performance model. So if you wanted a really high performance battery sucking SSD, you've got it. As with all things, we usually try to run the ADA64 cache and memory benchmark. In so doing on this platform, it's pretty obvious that Razer engineers have done a lot of hard work tuning this platform because out of the box, we've seen, you know, the 7000 H series Ryzen CPUs on other platforms not have the tuning and have well over 100, 150 plus nanoseconds in some configurations, but not on this platform. It is surprisingly thin and light, and it does a surprisingly good job with cooling for everything that's packed in here. I mean, think about it. With a 200 watt power brick, with this thing running full tilt, it has to dissipate 150, 200 watts of heat. And it does that effectively when it's plugged in. And yet, when it's on battery, it doesn't use anywhere near that much power and is still able to effectively dissipate the heat without feeling warm in your lap. Secondarily, this laptop has the best touchpad of any PC that I have ever used. I mean, this is Mac levels of touchpad goodness. I think every other PC manufacturer should probably buy a Razer laptop and check the touchpad and use the touchpad and see how well it works. Like. I didn't even think it was possible for the Windows touchpad drivers to be this good. Is that something that they did themselves? Is that something that is just a result of the hardware doing so much filtering and pre-processing before it hands it off to the Windows driver? Uh, it turns out that, yeah, there's probably some magic in the driver too because Linux, the touchpad experience is not as good as Windows, but it's still clear there's a lot of magic happening with the touchpad in hardware because the Linux touchpad experience is so good on this platform. Though the laptop is thicker than a thin and light, it is still absurdly thin and light for a laptop of this performance class with a discrete 4070 GPU. Like I can't emphasize that enough. One of the reasons they're, they kind of cheat to make it work is that the rubber pads 
the strips on the bottom are actually kind of tall in order to give it enough air to breathe properly. If you put it in battery saver mode, yeah, you, you can get north of four or five hours of runtime. It's still not all day runtime, but again, for a laptop that has a discrete GPU this powerful, this is kind of phenomenal battery life. If you're into machine learning or anything like that, we did a, a perfect workstation guide setup video using a, a desktop computer. But if you follow that guide, you can actually set up the Windows subsystem for Linux on this with CUDA and everything else and have all the accoutrement because CUDA will run perfectly fine on this 4070 GPU. I mean, you do have eight gigs of, of uh, video memory on that. So you can, you can do a lot with that. And for a portable machine, again, given the fact that it's a laptop, you could really do a lot with that in terms of development. This may be a better, you know, Linux developer workstation, whether you go the native route or the WSL route, than a lot of the uh, marketed Linux developer workstations out there for all the high-end features. I especially like the 2560 by 1600 display. At 100% scaling, the text is kind of small, but when you use above 100% scaling, Windows still doesn't handle that well. And especially if you're using an external monitor that has a different preferred scaling. So like 32 inches at 100% scaling is perfect, but 100% scaling at 2560 by 1440 in this small uh, display is mm, kind of small compared to what you would get on this sort of display. The only wrinkle with Linux support on this laptop is that it's not really officially sanctioned by Razer, so you're a little bit on your own with a couple of things and there's a couple rough edges, but Razer has actually put some work into supporting Linux on past model laptops that I can see in their user forums, so that's encouraging. Oh, and I almost forgot, this laptop is the first to feature Ryzen AI. It comes with the Microsoft Studio Effects Pack, which does background blur and eye tracking so that your eyes are always looking at the camera even when you're not looking at the camera, and some other really nifty features that are available from the webcam through Microsoft Teams. Now it does have a mechanical shutter, but the mechanical shutter doesn't actually turn off the webcam or the microphone, but it does block vision so you can slide the shutter over and you know, block, all that kind of stuff. But this is the first rise in AI that we've seen in an actual real world thing in this package. So it's nice that you can get those kind of tasks without costing you anything in terms of battery life or performance. Because if you use background blur in Teams on a laptop through the webcam, you know that the laptop will ramp the fans and struggle with it. And you've probably experienced that. With this, with studio effects, it doesn't do that, which is pretty cool and doesn't negatively impact your battery life because minimally, you know, it's getting hot and running the fans. It's, it's actually quite an impact on battery life for that kind of thing. Well, that's pretty much it for this one. Overall, very impressive engineering from Razer. I mean, the really thick metal case, there's no flex in it. It feels very sturdy without feeling like a brick, if that makes sense. I mean, it's a metal case. It, there's no flex, there's no give, but it's surprisingly lightweight. You know, it's not a touchscreen. It's a very nice matte 2560 by 1440 touchscreen, but yeah, overall, pretty good. Did I mention the 14 inch display is also 240 hertz? It's nice for productivity as well as gaming. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums.